to uh, insects. All of that will be improved over the next decade, two decades, allowing farmers to not only increase their yields, but to avoid the loss of yields that you might get from floods or drought. No, well, you asked for hope. You got it. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you to all the panelists. It's been a really informative discussion. Um, I had a, a question for Duncan from Erie. Um, just to continue that, you, you sort of touched on the topic I want to ask about, which is the dissemination of information. But also I was interested in the seed. Um, once you perfect a variety, or once you develop a variety that's accessible to a specific region, how do the farmers of that region access the seed? Do, you know, um, do you have another entity that you give it up to, either private or public, that that sells the seed? How do you handle patents? I'm just curious about that process. You know, it's a great question and it's really important. Um, essentially, our traditional partners are the ministries of agriculture. Through, through the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, we would develop a new technology, a new rice variety, and share it with the ministries of agriculture. And they're the ones who had these extension services. So in every community or province around Asia, Indonesia, Thailand, India, the Department of Agriculture offices would have this seed which they would multiply and share with farmers. As I was saying, those systems aren't as robust or well-funded as what they used to be or frankly should be. So now we partner with a whole range of organisations. Um, NGOs increasingly work very effectively at the grassroots with many Asian communities and NGOs working in poverty alleviation, a whole range of issues, understand that at the village level the fundamental need is food. You know, if you're, can, if you're working in a village in Laos and you're working in education, one of your biggest challenges is to keep the children in school because at sowing time and at harvest time they're out of school because they need help on the farm. So if you want to commit to good educational policies in Laos, it's really helpful to have a productive farm community around you that doesn't need the children out of school to help them. So NGOs, surprisingly in those areas, so we would work with Oxfam, increasingly a range of NGOs. And then the third area, of course, is the private sector. Um, in India, there's, there, it's a great example. If you're familiar with India now, there's increasingly companies like Tata and Reliance Industries setting up um, shops, outlets, all through the villages in the provinces that provide technologies to farmers. Um, and again, um, with, with Gates, it's one of their, obviously they're very experienced, as you would all know, with uh, product delivery and maintaining a product to the consumer. And so they tell us very clearly there's no point you developing a great technology or a great product if you can't get it to the people who need it. So it's a very important part of their aspect as well. well time marches on, we're getting thirsty and hungry and there's food back there. Yeah, food security. It's, uh, I think it's all gluten. So. But in any case, let's take one or two more questions. Yes, please. Doris. Yeah. In regard to the uh, difficulties uh, that you've all alluded to, uh, what about the uh, political ramifications that take place uh, in various countries? I'm thinking specifically of the difficulties in Thailand recently and how that kind of thing affects uh, the agricultural uh, production, etc. Is it uh, because, of course, in, in the case of Thailand, it was the uh, people in the northern part of the country, and they were primarily the uh, farmers, etc. So what does that do to price? What does that do to uh, the whole uh, uh, management of a crop which is being interfered with because of uh, political difficulties? And I'm not... There are other countries, Cambodia and uh, Vietnam, that are also affected. Uh, interesting question. What I find is that the government's getting involved. Uh, usually, it wishes Thailand is the, is the is the opposite, uh, and they get involved and they work very hardly. And India, being a very good example, to depress price aggressively uh, to keep the, the stable population. Uh, in Thailand, and like the U.S., you have the opposite problem. 
the growers have exacted a certain amount of political influence, and they've been able to get the government to hold what would equate to about 20% of world trade uh, in stock. Uh, and so, of course, politics is going to uh, If we could all not have politics, it, it would seem like a great idea, but politics will continue to play out its card throughout life. Um, and sometimes it helps food production, and sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it donates, and sometimes it withhelds the investment. The politicians will continue to play their important part. The one thing I think I find concern you know, to take from this is that if you look at cycles, psychological cycles through societies, the most con concerning point I see is that a lack of responsibility and a lack of foresight that you saw like in the, the World War II generation. They looked ahead. It wasn't about credit. It wasn't about political gain. It was about building a future, the Green Revolution. And what I see today in a lot of countries, including some of the ones you mentioned, is that it's the, about, the politics about today. And the problem is if you're never planning for tomorrow and you're playing for politics today, you're looking for credit, and you only put out fires that occur. You never put out fires that never existed. And I think that's my biggest, my biggest concern politically, is that people want to take credit for things instead of solving problems. And I see it universally throughout the world. It's about the credit, it's not about the future. And that's probably the more bigger concern. Uh, governments are going to play their role. You know. But that is a dangerous uh, thing going on of not looking ahead, only looking to today. Well, I'm an economic historian by training and instinct, and I guess I think this has been going on longer than, than Jeremy uh, might, might indicate. You know, Winston Churchill said you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Uh, we look back and say, oh, 50 years ago we looked forward, but in fact, if you were to go back and look at the debates at the time, we weren't very good at it then either. We muddle through. Um, and I'm actually fairly optimistic. I, I thought what uh, Duncan's list of the potential that science has on offer if we'll put the resources behind that. It's pretty clear now that the incentive structures are saying, yes, let's get that done. In 1986, 1990, 1995, who in their right mind would have invested in agriculture? It was dirt cheap. We know that's not true now. And what, what I hear Erie saying, and I, 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 I really buy into this, there are ways we can solve these problems if we make the right investments. And we were talking, you know, it doesn't look like the investor community, the official consultative group for international agricultural research, it doesn't look like that group's actually going to be able to get its act together. That does not mean we won't find another way to raise the resources. That's one of the reasons we're here, for heaven's sakes, is we're trying to find a way to raise resources in a more reliable way than government donors. And, and the question is, and I'll pass this real quick, is that if, if our population goes to 9 to 10 billion people, we have to have a solution, whether it's political or, or what. And, and I think Duncan and, and Peter are ahead of the curve. I just yeah, have to use that question as a, to give a plug for philanthropy. You know, I, I think it's governments will do so much, but it really, you know, Rockefeller Foundation supports us today. That's 50 years of support, and anybody who feels, well, there's still poverty and hunger in the world, I think is missing the point of that sort of committed long term support for philanthropy. We're not asking for that sort of support from everybody. But it's definitely philanthropists who can do two things. Embrace ideas that may not be politically acceptable. And two, stay committed, them, committed to them for a longer period of time than most governments. And that's what we need in food security. Um, and unfortunately, food security is not a natural uh, issue for philanthropists. And we have to somehow try to change that. Actually, that sounds like a good note to end this thing on. Shall we say, uh, shall we applaud the panelists? <laughs> and
the audience. And again, thank you to partners, uh, Asia Society, give to Asia, Asia Foundation. And thank you all for being here, and uh, I believe the table's open, right?